We try to bring you high quality educational and informational content every single day. Why do you think the price is having such an anemic time? The new story of the hour. Is this the beginning of a massive financial unraveling? We gotta add a little addendum to the show map today. So we start here on the daily. Now we've been looking at the RSI on the Bitcoin's daily chart for the last several days. Well, it's been increasing over the last 50 years since the The government Hey guys, what's going on? Jeb here and welcome back to Coffee and Crypto Live. This is your week daily morning show where we bring you the latest in everything Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And in today's video, we are going to be talking about the major drop that has occurred on Bitcoin over the last week. As you'll remember, last Thursday, Bitcoin began a drop from $73,000. It is currently trading at $63,000. And even the most bullish of assets have been in a collision course with the negative over the last seven days. Today, we're going to be talking about that drop that we've seen on Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, Binance, and everything else and talking about how we can best prepare our portfolios for the coming bull market in light of this incredible buying opportunity. Welcome to the stream. If you are new here, my name is Jeb McAfee. I've been doing cryptocurrency YouTube for over seven years and clearly still have not mastered internet. So sorry for everybody who was here for that first take, but we got it fixed. Sometimes things go sideways. Sometimes the devil or whoever you want to call it. You know, we used to call it Adobe, right? Adobe. We used to say there's Adobe running around here. You get it? Adobe. Photoshop, Premiere. There's Adobe running around here. He's always throwing a wrench in something. He's always breaking something, man. I don't know. You'd think after 30 years, internet, literally all I did was turn my computer off and turn it back on again. What? What should that have had to do with internet? I don't know. But either way, we are here. Adobe got in here and started uh, pulling the wires out and eating it. So anyway, it's fixed now. Looking forward to a wonderful stream with you guys. Apologies for the technical difficulties there. But let's go ahead and read some chat. Really excited to see all of you guys today. Ernesto Flores is in chat. Said, let's go, Jeb, and then showed the money bags. We are going to take our money bags away from the internet guy. No, just kidding. Uh, Erwin Rim said, oh, let's try again. That's right. Let's do it. Sometimes you just got to do a reset. You know, that's a, that's a, that is a life lesson right there, guys. Sometimes things go sideways, and instead of getting all beat up over it, you just got to hit the reset button. You know, sometimes you just got to take a second, press the button, turn it off, turn it back on again, and everything works again. Sometimes that's as, sometimes life is that simple. That's why that's the first thing you try when you're trying to diagnose technical difficulties. Joy Medley is in chat, said meow. Joy Van Englenberg said, good morning, brother. Called out, said wolf. Okay, how about that? Mr. Disco Hippo is in chat, said hump day. There we go. Ivan Cara is in chat. John Doe is in chat. Mike McNally is in chat. Chandler Skates in chat. Cosman B, what is up, my friend? Mike Lowry's in chat. AJ Knight, Piyush a PT for Hoofty Floofin, Dark Saiyan, Inspire, Line in My Pocket. And uh, let's see. I think I got everybody who's in chat right now. Thank you all for tuning in. If you guys do enjoy today's stream, consider hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel. It does really help uh, to support the content here, and I really appreciate seeing that number go up. Let's get right on into it since we're already a little bit late from those technical difficulties. Right now, Bitcoin trading just shy of $64,000. It is up ever so slightly over the last 24 hours, but it's still down 12.5% over the last seven days. Ethereum is currently trading at $3,343. It is down 16% over the last seven days, but up 3% in the last 24 hours. Binance up 3% in the last 24 hours, but still down 10% in the last seven days. And Solana seemingly building a head and shoulders pattern that could drive us well into the ground. It is trading at $172 after reaching a local high of about $207. At the moment, Solana is actually sitting right above its former market capitalization all-time high. So it's actually back-testing ATH right now, in case you guys didn't catch that. All-time high on Solana back in 2021 was roughly 75 to 76 billion dollars right now we have pulled back to right around 76 billion dollars once again and so solana is trying to see if they can hold that all-time high the same way that bitcoin was pulling back towards its all-time high in market capitalization bitcoin has not gone through anywhere near as much <clears throat> as much uh, inflation as solana has but bitcoin is doing basically the same thing right now market cap all-time high for bitcoin was 1.24 trillion dollars we are currently at 1.25 trillion dollars 
So what we are witnessing right now is a pullback that actually makes a lot of sense. The two cryptocurrencies that have gone beyond their market cap ATH are actually now back testing as support their market cap all time high. So if you didn't catch that, I want you to catch that because that's actually a really important fact to remember that we are back testing our previous market capitalization all time high. All right. And that does not, by the way, mean that we can't drop farther. It does mean that if we do drop much farther than this, below about sixty-one dollars to $62,000 on Bitcoin, below about $170 or so on Solana, then we will likely see a more pronounced correction that could be 20 to 25% instead of the 12 to 15% that we've seen thus far. Cardano is back testing a support level that it set a very long time ago at 60 cents. It's down 20% over the last seven days. Excellent, excellent, excellent area to load up on some Cardano if you are interested in getting into the project. If we go and take a look at DeFi Llama, I want to look over some of these projects as well. For example, right now, total value lock in the industry is sitting at $90 billion. Ethereum sitting at $47 billion, but Solana moonshotting in TVL. If you watched our video that went out yesterday on Solana, I, if you didn't, I really, really hope that you will go and watch that. Because that video, I outlined why Solana actually could go to over $1,000. So if you've not seen that video, please go back and watch that. And it has a lot to do with the total value locked on Solana. We have just lost in the last three days, $500 million in TVL, but we're still sitting at 3.8 billion and i think solana is going to be running in to catch up very quickly with the rest of the uh cryptocurrencies that have a lot of tvl like ethereum now i also want to look at cardano here it's currently sitting at 400 million dollars in market cap it's been through a major rally since the beginning of 2023 it's rallied from 50 million all the way up to a local high and actually an all-time high set last week of about a half a billion dollars in tvl something you got to keep in mind is that there's actually not a lot of big projects over here that are built out on Cardano that are also built out on other chains. The biggest thing you have here is Sunday Swap, right there. Spectrum Finance, which is also built out on Ergo. Who has ever heard of Ergo? And so there's not a lot of cross-platform, cross-layer one, cross-chain uh, integration going on with Cardano yet. But to be fair, that is also the case for Solana. You're going to continue to see the build-out of projects that are built mainly on Ethereum and the big ones. We're talking Lido and Aave, potentially Maker, probably Uniswap. Moving on over to Solana and Cardano, moving into this bull market. And when you do see that build-out on Solana and Cardano, it's going to cause Solana and Cardano both to outpace Ethereum. So why would we buy Ethereum? Well, Ethereum has a lower risk factor. You measure that in beta. It has a lower risk factor than Cardano and Solana for a multitude of reasons. So we invest in all of them to balance out the risk, minimizing the risk profile, maximizing our potential reward and return profile, and thus putting ourselves in the least risky, highest likely position to succeed in the coming bull market. Make no mistake, there is an act, there is a proper amount of risk to take. You can take too much risk, you can take too little risk. If you take no risk, you're like the fool that went and took the one piece of money and buried it in the ground. And when his master came back and asked him, why didn't you make anything of that money? You could have at least given it to the money changers and they would have at least earned usury on it. They would have at least earned interest on it and paid me that. That man took no risk and that was a foolish errand. That being said, if you dump everything into one project and you have no reason for that and you take too much risk all at once, and you lose all of your money, then that was foolish as well. My friend, I do like HBAR, and HBAR is a good project, but we're not going to be spamming the chat. All right, let's continue on and look at some of our other coins here. I also want to point out Chainlink. It's down 15% in the last seven days. Polygon's down 25%. Uh, Uniswap down 20%. HBAR, I don't mind talking about it. We're just not going to spam. Uh, HBAR is currently down 20%, sitting at around 10 cents. I think HBAR is a pretty solid project. We own some HBAR. And so when we're looking at HBAR's project, you can see, guys, that it has a very long way to go back to all-time high. It would 5x to go back to all-time high in price. It would about double to go back to all-time high on market cap. Something to keep in mind about HBAR, 50 billion max supply, only 33 billion out there in circulation. And it's gone through a lot of inflation since the last bull market. So make sure that if you're buying HBAR, you keep in mind that you have to look at the market capitalization chart. All right, let's take a look over at uh, let's take a look over at TradingView and look at the Bitcoin market because I do want us to understand that there are good times to buy and there are not so good times to buy. And in fact, actually, before we jump on over there, we're going to go to uh, we're going to go and take a look at the Fed Watch because we need to talk about the Fed. The Fed is going to be making a decision today. CME Group is pretty much always correct on this. It's extremely rare that CME is wrong. I have 
in fact in my entire career looking at this website i've never i've never ever ever seen uh the uh the cme group be wrong on their prediction but right now they are predicting that there is a 99 percent likelihood that there will not be a change in the effective federal funds rate um that the Fed will not be deciding to change the effective federal funds rate. It'll be saying exactly where it is when they have their meeting later on today. Of course, it comes out at 2, and then we have uh, Jerome Powell speak at 2.30. That's the way that it always goes. And so the reason that this is important is because we have very good reason to believe that there will eventually be a rate drop this year. And that's not just hypothesis. That is actually directly from a poll done by the Federal Reserve themselves. And in fact, if I just scroll back here, I think I might, might take too long, but I might be able to find the video. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to. But there was a, uh, so basically Jerome Powell, Jerome Powell polled the Federal Open Market Committee on what they thought back in December, what they thought the Federal Reserve uh, the federal funds rate would be moving into uh, moving into 2024. And they pretty much all came back with the same conclusion, and that was that there was eventually going to be a rate drop. The reason that this is so important is because when you drop the effective federal funds rates, you make money easier. There's a way that you can look at money. Um, there's a lot of different ways to analyze what money is, right? There's a lot of categories you can put it in. But one of the most important ones is whether it is easy or whether it is hard. And easy money is money that is very easy to borrow and it's very low interest. So for the 2010s, we had a large global period of growth. This had to do with peace. This had to do with the rebuilding of the world after the 2008 financial crisis. This had to do with um, the abundance of cheap labor in faraway countries where we could build our stuff and then we could consume it. The I don't want to say issue, but the concern is those countries have grown. And so they want to be paid more, which is a good thing, right? I'm not against that at all. I'm not against the Chinese and the Mexicans and all and all these different nations that build the stuff that the first world consumes. I'm not against them getting paid more. I think that that's a wonderful thing. And I think that that is a very good thing. What I will say, though, is that that does mean that the market ends up getting a little bit harder because the way that we had built the 2010s market was on the back of cheap labor. I mean, it's a little bit like we're living in the capital, guys. And the rest of Pan Am is living on bread. That's kind of the way the real world works. If anybody's ever watched The Hunger Games, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, not so thinly veiled commentary on the real world. And so the good news is, and this is good news, the good news is a large part of the world is being pulled out of poverty at a faster rate than at any time before in the history of mankind. The tricky news for that is that money gets a little bit harder because you have a higher production cost. And so when you have a higher production cost, oftentimes you end up having to charge more on the debt because of the growth of the economy. And so right now we're, we've seen interest rates skyrocket up to 5.3, which is nowhere near the, 80, the 70s and 80s where they're up near 20. But they're still very, very high, which means interest rates on uh, mortgage, uh, mortgage rates are sitting up at like 8. That is going to start coming down, but it's probably not going to come down to exactly zero. Even the Bank of Japan yesterday, we talked about this. Uh, BOJ increased interest rates by one uh, by 0.15 uh, 0.15% or about 15 basis points. They had not increased interest rates since before 2008. The last time that the Bank of Japan, in fact, I could probably find it here. Bank of Japan interest rates. I've never looked it up on here, but I'm going to assume, let's see if this is it. This is it, I do believe. That is what it looks like after all. The let's talk, Bank of Japan interest rate. Japanese interest rate. Here we go. All right, so this is the Japanese interest rates, I believe. Let me see. I'm going to check and see if this is the right chart. I think it is. Um, I'll be able to tell. Yes, this is the correct chart. Great. So this is the Bank of Japan's interest rates. The interest rates back in the nine back in the 70s were extremely high, up near 10, right alongside the United States' very high interest rates. They started coming down. Because in the 70s and 80s, Japan had a population bubble, and they started having more old people than they had new young people, and so they continued to drop the interest rates to try and stimulate growth. When you have easy money, you stimulate growth because the money is easy to borrow, it is cheap to pay back, and so it's easy to grow the economy on cheap money. Well, the Japanese have reached an inflection point where they seem to be coming in the opposite direction because for the first time in about, yes, yeah, 6,000 days, let's say, about 17 years, they hiked rates just yesterday. The effective federal funds rate 
here in the United States is going to start coming down. But both the BOJ, which don't forget, the Bank of Japan is still like the third or fourth largest economy on the planet. It's still a huge economy, even though its growth rate is stagnated. It grew so far in the 80s and 90s, it's stagnating for 30 years. It still puts it in the top five in the G7. The effective federal funds rate in the United States is going to start coming down. BOJ is going to start going up, and you're going to see them start to equalize around 1% to 3% over the course of the next five years. That's going to make things a lot... That's going to lead us into a new paradigm when it comes to global interest rates. In the short term, what that means is that, obviously, we're probably not going to have an interest rate cut tomorrow, or, or, or excuse me, today, but at the next meeting or in the meeting thereafter, there will likely be a cut. We have been all but guaranteed that there will be a rate cut at some point coming into uh, the end of 2024. And in fact, the CME group predicts that we're going to see a rate cut here because right now we're at five and, five and a quarter to five and a half. They're expecting there will be a rate cut um, in June. The 12th of June, we'll have a meeting. And then the 31st of July, there will be another meeting. And they actually have a pretty good likelihood that there could be a half a basis point rate cut by that point in time. And CME group here is predicting that we will be most likely at 4.5 to 4.75 by the end of the year, which was the median that we saw from the effective federal funds, uh, excuse me, from the Federal Open Market Committee and their predictions. So the reason that this is important is because as you see the effective federal funds rate in the United States go down, as you see the Bank of Japan's interest rate go up slightly, those both actually are very bullish for the global economy. Interest rates going up in Japan actually indicate strength because you raise interest rates in a season of strength to ha give yourself the ability to slow down economic growth because the economic growth is leading to too much inflation. That's why a central bank would do that. Then what ends up occurring is that when the interest rates get too high, as they are in the in the United States, then you start to lower them down to stimulate economic growth. Well, a 0.15 interest rate hike in Japan is not actually going to make that big of a difference from a fundamental standpoint, but from a sentiment standpoint, it signals to the world that Japan is moving into a very uh, prosperous time in its history. Japan is one of our closest allies. In fact, they are our very closest allies after our direct allies in NATO. And so with Japan growing and, have, and signaling that they are in a position to start going through economic development, development again and uh, continuing to grow. That's a very bullish sign for the markets the world over. And when we do start seeing effective federal funds rate cuts from the United States Federal Reserve, Federal Open Market Committee, that is invariably going to lead to a big rally on the stock market. So you've been thinking to yourself, Jeb, you've been rambling for 10 minutes. What's your point? I'm getting to it. All right. So the effective federal funds rate in the United States coming down is going to be very bullish for the stock market. It going up in Japan, paradoxically, is actually, in my opinion, going to be very bullish for the stock market as well because it indicates that they have strength. A 0.05% interest rate, which is what it is in Japan now, because it was negative one point, uh, negative 0.1%. They had negative interest rates for almost a decade. Nuts. You pay them to borrow money. That is asinine. Absolutely crazy. Negative interest rates are, a non, are in, nonsensical. I'm glad we're out of that. Okay, so <clears throat> with both of those movements over the course of the next six months, that is going to lead the stock market, the United States stock market, into a major rally. In history, whenever we compare the United States effective federal funds rate, and this is where we actually see something, whenever we compare the effective federal funds rate, when you see the market, when you see the effective federal funds rate jump off a cliff, you end up seeing a major market rally. So see here, somebody talked about this in financial coaching the other day. Um, whenever you see the interest rates drop, a lot of times that does go hand in hand with a crash. But, oh, what the, sorry about that. Not sure why my computer thinks that's appropriate. Um, a lot of times you do see the effective federal funds rate drop in confluence with the crash, but it's not the drop in the interest rates that's causing the crash. It's the crash that's leading the Fed to drop the interest rates. So don't get that twisted. The market drops and the Fed drops the interest rates to try and compensate because we're going into a recession. That's what we saw here in 01. We saw interest rates crash because there was a big market drop. We saw interest rates crash here in 2008 because they were trying to bring the economy back from the dead. And when you see very low interest rates, that leads to a lot of growth on the economy because you have near zero um, you have near zero cost of, um, cost, uh, cost of capital is the technical term in accounting for that, cost of capital. So the cost of capital goes down and it leads to a rally on the stock market. We've been going paraphlipimbolic on the United States S&P 500 for a very long time. And there's no reason to believe that that's going to slow down anytime soon. You'd think it would, but to be honest with you, it's probably not going to. 
the interest rates coming down gradually over the course of the rest of the decade moving into 2030 is just going to give even more gas to the effect to the stock market and you're probably going to see the United States stock market rallying up towards uh you know 500 600 700 800 US dollars here on the S&P 500 tr uh, ETF trust DJI could be pushing 50 or 100,000 that sounds crazy we're at 40k Jeb I know it but it stands to reason that it will continue to grow as it always has so long as the gears of industry continue to turn and I believe they will so what's the point here the effective federal funds rate increase uh, going down in the United States and the interest rate hike in Japan signaling strength from the Japanese is going to give investors reason to buy the United, United States stocks well Bitcoin and therefore the entire cryptocurrency market tags along with the stock market very nicely if you compare the United States stock market to Bitcoin they move almost exactly in tandem almost identically do they move whenever the stock market is in a major rally so too is bitcoin when the stock market starts to falter even if it doesn't go into a major crash but it starts to falter bitcoin goes into its bear market for your having cycle it's almost like the four-year having cycle is starting to be imprinted upon the stock market because bitcoin is such a big market i think it is starting to have some degree of an effect on it crash on stocks here on the line chart was in confluence with the crash on Bitcoin. The crash on stocks was actually one of the things that helped the crash on Bitcoin. Make no mistake, the stocks caused Bitcoin, not the other way around for the most part. Although there probably is a little bit of there probably is a little bit of inter interplay there. Um, the stock market goes up, Bitcoin goes up as well. And so the stock market has a very, very bullish outlook, in my opinion. And so with that bullish outlook, over the next six to 12 months, that's going to make Bitcoin go up dramatically. But there's many other reasons to believe that Bitcoin's going to go through a major rally. That's just one of them that I wanted to explore because today is the effective federal funds rate decision. Now, how does this all play in to Bitcoin right now? Well, the way it plays into Bitcoin right now is that if Bitcoin has every reason geopolitically to continue into a major rally, then we have every reason right now to buy the flipping dip. Don't trip by the dip. You've heard the song, okay? If you haven't heard the song, look it up. <laughs> crypto makes some funny music. I don't know what it is, but there is some funny music that comes out of crypto. Don't trip by the dip. Buy the dip, buy the dip. That's what that's what we want to do right now. Okay, so Ethereum's down here around 3,300. Not really concerning at all. Solana's down around 175. Solana could definitely use with a bigger correction. I don't know if it's going to get it because it's so parabolic right now, but it definitely could. Um, you know, Cardano, for example, down here around 60 cents. People love to hate on Cardano. There's so much FUD. You know, the hope stealer, the the hope stealers, the fudsters, the people that that just hate life. They just wake up depressed. Like they, they come out and they say. Oh man, Cardano is never gonna. It's never gonna, it's never gonna go anywhere. And oh, it dropped down to sixty cents. Big whoop, big whoop. Cardano is still up two hundred and thirty-five percent in one hundred and fifty days. I'd call that a pretty good return. It might not beat Solana, but I'd still be happy if you're holding Cardano and you bought it down here below thirty or forty cents. All right, so Cardano is eventually going to go through a big rally as well. I do believe. So. Should we buy the dip? Yes, I think we should. Should we be worried about the long-term trajectory of the cryptocurrency markets? I don't think so. Freezing rates is very bullish. That is true. Cutting rates signals something is broken. So moving the interest rate in either direction does signal that the Fed doesn't like where something is. They are probably going to start cutting rates just because they don't want to slow down the economy too much. And it can take well over two years for an interest for a Fed, for a uh, Fed rate decision to really impact the economy. And the reason for that is that when you change the cost of capital, well, then for that to impact business, you got to wait around for the business to take out a you, excuse me. You have to wait around for the bank that, they, that the business is borrowing money from to change their rate because the base rate, the effective federal funds rate changed. Just keep in mind the way this works. Federal Reserve made up of 12 banks, and there's a central bank. Um, they issue the effective federal funds rate, and the effective federal funds rate is the cost of capital. It is the interest rate if you're going to borrow money from the Fed, and pretty much all the national banks do. And so if the, if the national banks are borrowing, excuse me, if the, uh, if the um, commercial banks are borrowing at 5.33, which is the current rate from the Fed, then what are they going to do? They're going to turn around and charge 8 because they want to make the arbitrage. And so if the effective federal funds rate goes down a quarter of a basis point, then you got to wait around for the banks to get competitive on dropping the rates because technically if they all just got in cahoots and could get on the same page, but they're bankers, so they're not very good at that, then they wouldn't actually have to lower the interest rate. They would just take the extra quarter of a basis, po basis point of profit. But what ends up happening is that one of them steps out of line and says, aha, I'm going to drop it a quarter of a basis point. Screw you all over. And then everybody goes and takes out and borrows money from them. And then everybody else has to drop it. But that process can take a few months. 
So you get you you drop the effect of federal funds, right? Then you got to wait around for the banks who actually, through com competition and capitalism, drop their interest rates because they might not do it right away. In fact, they almost never do it right away. And then you got to wait around for a big business that this actually matters to to come and borrow money from that bank at that new rate after they've sat there and fought over it instead of just taking the extra profit margin. Um, and so they... they um, so the, uh, the, you got to wait around for the business to come and borrow the money. Then you've got to wait around for the business to spend that money based on the interest rate that they borrow the money at. Then you have to wait for the executive team and especially the CFO of that company to figure out, okay, this is how much our cost of capital is. This is how much our, our interest rate is on this money. We are now going to be able to do X, Y, and Z in the third. And this is going to impact our earnings in X, Y, Z in the third. And then you have to wait around for the quarter when the fiscal reports come out. And it, it's a long process. Oh, and by the way, I didn't even mention that you borrow the money to build a factory that doesn't come online for five years. You borrow the money to buy 100,000 metric tons of iron ore that's going to take two years to go through the manufacturing process. To get to final assembly, to be sold on the market, takes you, know, you put it into a Ford Explorer, sits on the lot for three or four months, then it finally gets sold, then that actually impacts the economy. When you change the effective federal funds rate, it can be a multi-year process. So the Fed looking out on average, probably about one to three years, right around that two-year mark, saying, all right, we think we're going to slow things down too much two years from now. If we have interest rates at five and a third, then they're going to start cutting them now in anticipation of what's going to happen in, in two years. Because moving the interest rates does not move the market in real time other than the sentiment. It'll move the sentiment instantaneously because information flow happens instantly. Monetary flow and the flow of information through material processing and through business, that can take months in years. So it's signaling bullishness for the market is a short-term effect. It actually being bullish for the market on a fundamental standpoint can take years. So the Fed tries to front run things as much as they possibly can. And I'll tell you what, the Fed in a lot of ways is pretty good at telling what the market's going to do. You know why? Because they're the ones that are controlling it in the first place. All right, guys, we have 600 people watching live right now. Only about 105 likes. If anybody's interested, if anybody has, excuse me, not interested, if anybody, if any of you have enjoyed today's stream, consider hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel. All right. Global markets are down compared to US and Japan. Why after cutting rates, it becomes more bullish than buying other markets like China stock market. Nobody wants to buy the Chinese stock market because it's inflated and China is a, full, is a bubble of all bubbles. You thought 2008 was a bubble. Ha, it was, don't get me wrong. China is going to completely collapse in on itself in the next 20 years. Mark my words, take a pen, write it down. China is going to dissolve compared to what it is right now. China's pretty powerful right now. They are, they are fairly the second largest economy on planet Earth. The issue is they didn't get there in the right way. They didn't get there in a sustainable way. They cut as many corners as they possibly could, burned so many bridges that at some point when they start to get weaker and weaker and weaker and their trajectory looks like it's going down and down and down, everybody's going to jump ship. Like your wisdom, love listening to you. Thank you so much, Rolando Lima. I really appreciate that. Adewale Ser Seriki is in chat. Said, just join. God bless you. God bless you as well, to my friend. Satya321 said, here a bit late today. If only work was more considerate to when Jeb goes live. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you could be here. Don't trip by the dip. That's right. Okay. Historically speaking, interest rate cuts signal market tops. Aren't you worried about that? So you got to factor in the type of rate cut. That's a great question, but you got to factor in the type of rate cut. So I will show you the, uh, I'll show you what, why I don't think that's really the case in this instant. Um, rate cuts normally just slash instantly, right? They normally slash very, very, very quickly. That is not the trajectory that the Fed is predicting will occur this time. We saw interest rates cuts slash instantly here in the uh, in 2019 and in 2020. That was because of the pandemic. They were slashing interest rates in response to a major market crash. Here, we were signaling interest uh, interest rates started dropping in response to the 2008 financial bubble bursting. Even back in 01, the recession that began after 9/11. Uh, and the dot-com bubble and all of that jazz, right? 
They started slashing interest rates in response to a recession. If a recession starts, then yeah, they will slam them straight to the floor to stimulate economic growth and to push us through the economy. It's a little bit like giving, I don't know, let's say you for some you have to drive through the night and so you drink a Red Bull. Like that's that's what the Fed is doing. When the market goes into a recession, they just cut the interest rates to energize the economy. They do it all at once so that, oh my gosh, money is free now. Let's go buy everything and stimulate GDP because uh, GDP, otherwise known as the circulation of money through an economy, is what drives the growth of the stock market in large part. Okay, it's not that simple, but in large part, that's what it is. So that if they can give basically free money away, um, at least in the form of debt, then, then that will stimulate uh, uh, GDP, that will stimulate the growth of the market, that will stimulate economic activity, etc. Now, what the Fed is projecting this time, and this surprised me at first, but then I thought about it and I realized why they're doing this. What the Fed is projecting this time is they're not just going to slam interest rates to the floor. No, they're going to drop them by maybe half a basis point, half a sorry, half a percentage point, 50 basis points a year for the next several years. That that kind of drop that looks something more like this, I, I think we could both agree it looks very different than just being slammed to the floor. What we're probably going to end up seeing is a recession may or may not happen at some point in the next five to 10 years. And if one does, then the interest rates will probably be on a, on a trajectory like this, and then they'll just crash them. And the chart will end up looking something like this. This immediate drop would definitely signal a recession. No doubt about it. But this gradual dropping off, they're just trying to return it to 2% because they want to get inflation down to target two. They've got inflation down around 3.2. Historically speaking, if you look at the last 60 years or so, inflation hovers around 4%. Um, in, uh, in the 21st century, it's been a little bit lower than that, but they're trying to get it down to at least 2.5. They want around target 2%. They're looking for 2% growth every year. Effective federal funds rate being a five and, five and a third is just too high. They just don't need it to be that high to achieve that goal. And so that's why they're going to slowly drop it down to probably about 3% or so over the course of the next few years doesn't necessarily signal a crash because they are dropping it in a different way. Christina Melinti donated $9.99 of Ron. What is that? Ron currency. What currency is that? Romanian Liu. That is so cool. My family, uh, my in-laws, my wife's family, they, uh, they spent 14 years living in Romania. Um, most of my family actually speaks Romanian. Uh, my my mother-in-law speaks Romanian uh, very fluently to the point where I actually thought it was her first language. So that's really cool. How about that? Very, very, very beautiful country. A lot of I've heard a lot of stories there. They went over there right after the wall fell. Um, and then they went over again from 2004 to 2011. Beautiful country. A lot of very interesting stories, especially about the first trip. Um, I hear Romania is doing a lot better now, and I hope that's the case. All right, so Render. Render, render, render. Uh, render is a project I'm investing in and I'm excited about because I am a bit of a tech nerd. My first computer that I ever had, um, th the first thing I ever spent money on after the channel started making money was a new computer. I built this really fancy computer uh, because I wanted to be able to run the because I wanted to be able to run the um, streaming software and everything. You know, just talking about technical difficulties. You guys know we built this channel up to about fifteen thousand subscribers and our videos were at about five frames a second. Like, literally, like maybe 10 frames a second. It was awful. And they were unedited and everything. I don't know how it happened. It was a, it was, it was a law. It was godsend. But we just were deadly consistent. Every single flipping day, I'm going to put out a video. And um, I built this computer. It was about a $2,000 rig. And I had only ever made like $3,000 in my life, right? So built this rig. And I was able to make videos that were, you know, 60 frames a second, uh, 108, um, um, 1080p it was it was great it was awesome but one of the things i fell in love with at that time was gpus and the ways that that computers work and render has a really cool mission here right let's see render has a really cool mission here distributed gpu rendering on the blockchain back in the day i realized man i'm never going to be able to run this channel if i don't get a better rig like my computer sucks i mean it was a compact presario ever heard of that no you haven't just be honest you've never heard of that before in your life and it was uh, like a Q503 or something. It was like a 10-year-old computer, and it sucked when it was new. <laughs> That's what we started this channel on, guys. Oh, my goodness. Um, but anyway, I realized I needed a much stronger GPU to actually be able to run the channel. So uh, I kind of wish that this was around back then. <laughs> but essentially, the Render Network provides near-unlimited decentralized GPU computing power for next-generation 3D content creation. That's a really, really cool idea. I'm not going to get too much into exactly what it does, but it's a very, very cool idea. 
Um, and essentially it allows GPUs not to just sit idle. They're always kind of doing something and it makes them more usable. It makes them more, it just makes them more. You, yeah. Anyway, it's a cool project. And so the reason people are talking about it is because it's just been blowing up recently. It wasn't really ready in the last bull market, but this bull market came and it's ready to take off. It's currently sitting four and a half billion dollars market cap. I think it is going to continue rallying. Um, I don't know how far. Rank number 26 seems pretty high for the project because it's a good idea. But is it a 20, 30, 40 billion dollar project? I'm not sure. Not sure. But I think you're going to get at least another two or three X in... Uh, in render. All right, that is really funny that you guys actually know what I'm talking about with Presario. Presario. Um, I do actually know what a compact Presario is. That is hilarious that so many of you got I know compacts well, you poor soul. As kids, we had Commodore 64. Yeah. I mean, seriously, go back and watch any of the videos from the first year of the channel. I'm talking the first year here. <clears throat> I built the computer about nine or nine or ten months after I started the channel. Go back on the videos here. Go to oldest, watch some of these videos like, um, let's see, we had a Litecoin. Where is it? Um, let's see. Sure. Bitcoin 10,000. Let's see if I can, if you can see me kind of clicking around here. Do you see the frame rate here? Watch my mouse. This is the third video on the channel. You guys can go find this. Let's see if there's any place. Surely there's a place where I'm moving the chart around. Watch how laggy this is. Do you see this? This is horrible. This is so terrible. Why did you guys watch this? Bitcoin's back at $9,000. Whew. Man, this is 2017 here. You see how laggy it was? <laughs> so bad. But guys, you got to start somewhere. Like I said, this is six years ago now. It's got 900 views. Sorry, 700 views. And most of those came later. It uploaded and got like 20 views. November 27th, 2017. We've been doing this a while. Somebody said, OMG, this is crazy. So I decided to go back in time and see how your videos were back in the day. Pretty cool, Jim. Yeah. It's, uh, it was pretty bad. I'm so glad you upgraded your mic. Oh my, this is pretty bad. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. It's bad, but you got to start somewhere. All right, guys, we are going to wrap it out here pretty soon. Before we do, I do just want to let you know that today's stream is brought to you in part by Blowfin. The reason you want to sign up for Blowfin is because they are an awesome exchange and they've got absolutely everything you need to become successful in cryptocurrency when it comes to your exchange products. They've got, they've got futures trading. They've got copy trading. They've got leverage trading. They've got an earn program where you can actually make money with um, with staking. They've got a really, really, really cool feature that will only be available for about another 24 hours where if you trade $50,000 on Blowfin, you can actually spin a wheel and make some money. So make sure to check that with the link in the description box down below. I will show you real quick, actually. Let me show you this. This is with the link in the description box down below. You gotta go sign up with the link right above this. But... Every time you trade $50,000 of volume for the next 19 hours, so this is just basically the rest of today and then a little bit of tomorrow morning, you can hit the spin the wheel button and get 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 USDT, any of those numbers, an iPhone 5, or an Apple Vision Pro. If you go spin the wheel, get $50,000 of, of USDT trading volume, you can spin the wheel and get something. If anybody spun the wheel, I want to know, what'd you get? All right, guys, make sure to sign up for Blowfin using the link in the description box down below. And also, guys, don't forget about NordVPN. You definitely want to check out NordVPN because, the, and the reason for that is because NordVPN is going to keep you safe while you browse online. So make sure to check them out and get a big discount today. Uh, Compact Presario. I just want to look at this real quick before we go. Here we go. This, yeah. Is this it? This is it. This is the computer right here. I think this is it. Ooh, man. So bad. Such a bad computer. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this computer, man, this was all I had. I'd play Minecraft on this. I I started the, yeah, I did a lot. It would take so long to do anything on this thing. Let's see. Okay. It's so bad. Such a bad computer. I'm sorry, Compaq. I'm sorry, Presario. I don't mean to, I don't mean to trash you. But hey, this thing, I re yep, that's it, right there. This thing built the Crypto Jeb YouTube channel. It sucked, but it did it. It was the workhorse for the first nine months. You know what I mean? It did it. Let's see, this is on Best Buy. This is on BNH Photo. I wonder if there's one for sale. I don't even know if you can buy these anymore. Look at this. Two gigabytes of RAM. 
Yep, the AMD dual core. I remember I remember replacing the 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 um CPU in this thing like 10 years ago. Saved up money for so long just to do that. Windows 7. Yep, Windows 7. Who remembers Windows 7? The Radeon graph integrated graphics did not have a graphics card. That's what made me remember this. Whoo, man. Yeah, those were the days, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> they were the days now because they are not the days anymore. <laughs> what is the name of the trading view indicator Jeb has made? That's called the Crypto Jeb Oscillator. You can get access to that by going to luxalgo.com forward slash Jeb and signing up over there. Really, really enjoying the Crypto Jeb indicator. By the way, do want to show you this. We have a new landing page over here with Crypto Jeb on Luxalgo. If you go to luxalgo.com forward slash Jeb, you will see our Crypto Jeb logo right here. And if you scroll down, you're going to see the Crypto Jeb oscillator. Introducing the exclusive, this is a beautiful landing page. Shout out to Sean and Luxalgo. Introducing the beautiful Crypto Jeb oscillator. In collaboration with Jeb McAfee, bring your trading view charts to the next level with the most powerful oscillator for efficient technical an analysis. Works on any market, including all of crypto. It's beautiful. Spot reversals and trade like a pro. The Crypto Jeb Oscillator introduces a full systematized approach to trading real-time divergences, following trends, and finding key reversal points. Access in any Lux Algo plan, and you can get access to it instantly right over here by going to the monthly or the annual plan, getting the essentials or the premium, and signing up here. Premium is the best place to go, and you will get access to the Crypto Jeb Oscillator that was created by me in partnership with Lux Algo. So make sure to go and check out this new landing page. It's awesome. It's so flipping cool. Make sure to go and check that out and sign up if you have not already. All right, guys, I got to wrap it out. We're running out of time here, but I do want to let I do want to see you guys in chat just a little bit more. Windows XP was the goat. Yes. At least you missed the Windows ME days, the worst. All right, guys. Look at that glorious beast, Jamie Stringer said. That's right, man. Haven't used that computer in six years. But that started it all. That just goes to show you guys, no tech can stop you. If you've got something and something to say, you can make it work. All right, guys, I got to wrap it out. I'm trying to be a lot better about my schedules and everything here. I was on time today, and then we ended up having tech difficulties. So sorry about that. Hopefully, you guys did enjoy today's stream. Continue looking forward to the new stuff that we're doing. We've got a lot going on. Uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap it out. Before I go, though, I do just first want to thank each and every single last one of you for watching, as always. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.